This sequence of videos goes through circular orbits, which is section 8.3 in night. This is a application of what we've been doing with circular motion and central forces. So there isn't a lot of new ideas here, just an application of what we've been talking about, and hopefully some connections with things that we've seen in previous chapters of the class. So our goals here include relating circular orbits to projectile motion, something that we've been dealing with since pretty much the first week. And the second thing we want to talk about are what the properties of circular orbits actually are. And in this case, it's showing why we can use our central force model to think about them. The learning outcomes are largely problem solving, but again, this is a specific situation in which we would be applying everything we've been talking about in the previous sections. So first, let's look at projectile motion versus circular orbits. So something to think about is that there's a curvature to projectile motion that normally we use the flat earth approximation and our projectile our orbit if we think of it as having some initial height right we can just call this some initial height h we can give it an initial velocity in the horizontal x direction good old x y coordinates right so we see that there's a curvature here, but we say that the Earth is flat. So the particles curving downwards and eventually gets to the Earth. But of course, the flat Earth approximation is only an approximation. If you were very far away from the surface of the Earth, you see that in fact the Earth is curved. So what does that mean? We know that our trajectory is still curved, but we have to think about what's happening to the Earth's surface which is also curved. Eventually, we would need to zoom very, very far out to see this. We would see that our planet, our Earth, looks like a sphere. And we can think about what different projectile paths would look like. So again, we need to be launching this from some initial height. And it has initially a horizontal launch speed. Now this is going to be very, very fast. So our initial shape, you know, went and hit the ground. So that's what this would look like. It just goes down and bam, hits the ground. But as we shoot it with a larger and larger speed, it would go farther before hitting the ground. And we would start to see the Earth curving away. So that's what happens here. Projectile path A is like this path. It just goes down, hits the Earth. Projectile B has a higher initial speed so it goes farther and the earth curves okay so we now actually have the curve of the earth projectile c has a greater speed note that in all of these cases we are launching it perfectly horizontally from the same initial height so c has an even greater speed and starts curving around and now hits the other side of the earth eventually you are able to find the perfect speed and you get to d it is falling, right? Like the initial launch direction was this. So we do see that it keeps falling, but it actually falls in parallel with the Earth. So our trajectory is curving downwards, but it curves just the same way that the planet itself curves. So this is the idea of going from projectile motion and considering the fact that if we go away from our flat Earth approximation and actually get to a curved planet, eventually we see that we're going to get an orbit. And that's what we would call path D, that this is a circular orbit around our planet. It comes back to the point it starts from, it is a circle, and it is centered on the planet. What forces do we need to think about? The only forces we need to think about here are gravity. There is a single force, which is our net force. So in our old-fashioned projectile motion situation, our net force was simply the gravitational force. And we called this straight down, right? Again, in this situation, we would say that we have x and we have y. And we would say that gravity always acts in the negative y hat direction. But again, that was only an approximation. So when we go over to our spherical planet, now instead we would want to think about our tangential direction and our radial direction. Z would be, for instance, like out of the page, right? So we don't need to worry about uh, that. 
but in particular you see that you now have a gravitational force that is always radial. We have a gravitational force that is always towards the center of the planet. So if we zoomed in to one point, right, if we zoomed into this, that would look like this. That would look like the force was straight down. But in fact, the people who stand on the bottom of the planet, Australia is typically the example we use for that, you know, to Australians, when they drop a ball, the ball goes down, but that's still towards the center of the planet. So for a circular orbit, the net force we have is still only due to the force of gravity. In that way, these agree. However, now we have to use a different coordinate system because we are actually going in a circle around the Earth. So what this means is that a circular orbit is actually freefall. That freefall was our situation where we only had the force of gravity in the y direction or the acceleration due to gravity. And now we've said that we have that situation in a circular orbit. So projectile motion or freefall generalized to be, say, much faster uh, is going to actually give us an orbit. So same situation because fundamentally your net force is only the gravitational force and it's always pointing in the same direction. So conceptually if that's something to understand that projectile motion and orbits are really due to the exact same physics but we can also do a little bit of math here and that is to think about the speed that an orbit must occur at and this is coming from what we've developed already for circular motion and the idea that if you have a central force model circular motion that there is a fixed relationship between the net force towards the center the radius and the speed that the object is going in its circle so let's think through what that is for an orbit we know the force the force is easy that's the gravitational force and it is m times g towards the center so in our normal rtz coordinate system we would call that r hat that towards the center was r hat so then what? Well, then we think that that is our only force, right? We don't have any other forces going on because this is an orbit. We have nothing in contact. So because of that, we get to say that our net force is equal to our gravitational force. So when we say, remember that our centripetal acceleration was equal to the radial net force divided by m, we also know that our centripetal force is equal to v squared, where that's the velocity of our orbit, divided by the radius of our orbit. So this is coming from just really the definition of uh, centripetal acceleration. And again, we first met this uh, back in chapter four, I think. And this is just coming from Newton's second law. Okay. So because we know this, we get to plug this in for there. And we do one more line of math. And what we see then is that once I divide F, uh, mg by m, this g comes down there. The double equal sign was a mistake. Don't worry about that. And this was coming from our definition of centripetal acceleration. So that comes over here. We can now solve for our orbital speed and we get this. This means that when you have something orbiting your Earth or any planet, well, sorry, Earth because of G, that you have some R that the circle is occurring at, and in order for this to occur, we know exactly that V orbit in magnitude is equal to the square root of R times G. Okay. So, if we then plug in the radius of the Earth, so this is assuming that our object that's orbiting the Earth is really, really close to the surface of the Earth, right? Like close, 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 such that we can think of the radius of the orbit as effectively being the same as the radius of the Earth. We know what g is, 9.8 meters per second squared, that this actually gives us 7,900 meters per second. This is 7.9 kilometers per second. This is incredibly, incredibly fast. So this is why when you throw a ball sideways, it doesn't just become a satellite orbiting the Earth. You have to throw that ball incredibly fast sideways, and then sure, it will orbit the Earth. 
but most of us can't throw anything this fast. And in particular, if it was really close to the surface of the Earth, such that we have like clouds above it, you know, there might be trees in the way, that'd be bad. I'm just showing off my art here, that's all. Um, the other problem is air resistance. So think that this orbital speed is really, really fast. Again, 7.9 kilometers per second, way faster than the speed of sound. Nothing goes this fast on Earth um, in a mac macroscopic way. I'm sure that there are microscopic examples, but macroscopically in air, nothing goes this fast on Earth. So that's why we don't see projectile motion suddenly becoming orbits all the time. So then let's think about the details of this. We've developed our model, we calculated a speed, but let's back up just a little bit. So first, here we are only considering circular orbits. Why is that? Because of our central force model. Our central force model said that we can use this central force, right, which is this red thing here, only if R is constant. So something that's worth saying, especially for those of you who've had some astronomy, a lot of orbits are ellipses, that many things in space do not orbit in circles. The math we just used only applies to circles. So that's something important to think about. Um, this is a very limited model because we are using the central force model, which is only for fixed values of R. So the orbit radius is actually the height above the surface plus the radius of the planet. And again, the previous example we did was assuming that the height above the planet was very small. So this is basically the radius of your planet, and then you have a little height. And so the radius of our orbit would be the radius of the planet plus the height. Um, and again, this is effectively a uniform circular motion model. Once we have uniform circular motion, ellipses are definitely out. So that means that we must have our net force towards the center, again that's our gravitational force, and it must be constant. Because we know that our net force must be towards the center and we can't have anything changing our speed, we can't have any forces that are tangential, that's why we can't have air resistance. So not only would air resistance potentially make our object burn up, um, right, like when meteors crash into the earth they usually burn up in the air, so air resistance would generate a lot of heat and cause whatever this is to catch on fire. The second problem being that it would slow it down and literally make our central force uniform circular motion model fail. So these are some details here that are really worth worrying about.